All right, so yeah, thanks everyone for coming to the talk today. Um, I'm Travis Adair. I'm the CTO of a company called Predibase. I'm also the lead maintainer on the open source project uh, Lorax, uh, which is a uh, little bit of a, a cheeky name that comes from Lora Exchange, uh, which we'll talk about the premise behind that. But essentially, uh, the high level reason why uh, you might be interested in checking out this project is that uh, we're a production ready serving stack for LM inference that is specifically uh, oriented towards use cases where you would want to serve many fine tuned LLMs at once um, on a single GPU. So, you know, we like to say that we let you scale to hundreds and thousands of LLMs. And we'll talk a little bit about why you might want to do that, um, why you don't just want to, you know, necessarily go with whatever the latest and greatest base model is and just run that uh, with as many GPUs as you can. Um, but uh, yeah, let's go ahead and briefly get into that. So, um, you know, one thing that we'd like to say to start off with is that we're in the midst of this AI revolution. Um, certainly, if you look at the trend over the past few years, you might come to this conclusion that what's ultimately driving all this progress is models are getting ever bigger uh, and therefore ever more capable. And so, you know, the, the key to getting uh, benefits from generative AI in particular is like using the biggest and the baddest models like the GPT-4s and the Clouds and things like that of the world um, and that we don't really need these smaller models anymore. Um, but one thing we like to say um, within our group at Predibase is that um, these bigger models are not necessarily always better for the task or the problem that you're trying to solve. Um, and so one analogy or, or example that we like to point to is, you know, general intelligence is great, but I don't need a point of sale system to recite French poetry. And by that, what we're really saying is that if you know, your use case is very narrow and specialized, you don't need to be deploying a system that is very general purpose and can solve all these different use cases that you don't care about, because one way or another, that's gonna come back to bite you in you know, the memory footprint that you're, putting, you're having to deal with or um, the latency and throughput uh, that you can achieve with such a system. And so what we like to say is that um, when we look at how organizations are adopting generative AI in practice, oftentimes what we see is this pattern play out where you start with a very big general purpose commercial LLM like a GPT-4, um, but these uh, LLMs have some uh, limitations. You know, I, I touched on a few of them, but oftentimes organizations find that uh, lack of model ownership is a problem, that you know, oftentimes uh, they can change things out from under you, even though you've built a whole production system on top of this. You know, they update a minor version or something and everything breaks. You can't take it and move it somewhere else if you need to due to some changes in their terms of service, et cetera. Uh, classic open source versus commercial kind of argument. Um, also, the need to give up access to your data. You know, these systems live, you know, somewhere else, one way or another, even if they claim that they're not keeping it, it's still transmitted over the wire. So, you know, certain compliance issues come to play. And then the one that I mentioned already, too slow, expensive, overkill for most tasks. Um, it's, you know, the Swiss army knife that can do many things, but usually if you're going to production for an enterprise application, you need something that's very fit for purpose that does one thing and does it really well. So what can you do instead? Well, you can start with systems like this to get started and build out prototypes. And the nice thing is you don't have to worry about building training data sets and doing all this classical data science work that we used to do uh, three to five years ago. Um, but over time, as you start to identify these more important use cases, what you can do is start to think about um, taking the individual things that you're doing with these models and uh, building out more specialized uh, inference systems for these particular use cases. So I might use you know, a 40 billion parameter open source model to prioritize customer support tickets. I might fine tune Llama 213 billion to become a customer service chatbot. Um, I might use even a smaller encoder-only model like BERT to do uh, sentiment analysis or sentiment detection. And the benefits of doing this is that, you know, when you're using these open source models in particular, it's something you own that you can take with you and move wherever you want. You don't have to share your data to, to use them, right? Um, they're smaller and faster, which is a point we'll, we'll touch on. Um, and you can also control them, control the outputs more explicitly, so if you have you know, a particular JSON schema that you need it to conform to, or if there's certain things you need to say or not say, it's a lot easier to build that into the system through techniques like fine tuning and having low level access to the, the weights and the logits that come out of the model. 
Um, and we find that this is actually not just something that sounds good on paper, but it is actually something that plays out in practice. Uh, so we just we, we recently did an analysis running um, you know something like 30 different data sets and tasks across all these different models. And what we found was pretty much universally, like for specific tasks that are very narrow in purpose, like um, classification or triage or named entity recognition, JSON extraction, things like that, summarization, that even a model that's only 7 billion parameters uh, can very easily outperform models like GPT-4 when uh, they're fine-tuned for the specific task. So if you look at the gray bar, that's kind of the performance uh, with the baseline model before any fine-tuning. But then once you apply fine-tuning, you know, even something as small as Phi 2, which is like a 2 billion parameter model, um, up to something like Mistral 7 billion or Zephyr 7 billion, um, are starting to outperform GPT-4 pretty handily. And these models are you know, about 100x smaller um, than a model like GPT-4. And since we're specifically talking about use cases for fine-tuning uh, many models and not just a single model, uh, let me also briefly touch on uh, some reasons why you might want to fine-tune more than just one. Um, so for a company like us, uh, we have you know, an AI platform that supports many customers, and so each customer might be doing their own fine-tune models. You know, a lot of the companies that um, we talk to or that I've worked at with in the past have similar use cases internally where they have machine learning platforms that service lots of internal customers with their own use cases. Um, but even an individual machine learning engineer or data scientist might want to create segmented models where you have a single task, but maybe different users or products or regions that you want to apply it to with different segments of the data. Um, agent systems and workflows where you have you know, maybe a DAG of different calls that you need to make to the LM. Each of those could be its own fine-tuned model. Um, speeding up task-specific workflows through techniques like speculative decoding, which is a fine-tuning technique for the best results. Um, and also personalization um, is becoming more common as well with newer techniques like control vectors that let you kind of massage the inputs uh, without a lot of uh, prompt tuning required. But I think the big hurdle for adopting um, fine tuning and serving fine tuned LMs really comes down to cost uh, today for most users. Uh, so if you look at kind of the standard AWS on demand hourly pricing without any credits, um, even something like an A10G, which is kind of like a entry level serving GPU, um, runs over a dollar uh, an hour, $1.21 an hour to run, um, which if you extrapolate that out to what your monthly cost to stand up an instance 24 hours a day would be, um, as you layer on more and more fine-tuned models that you want to serve, assuming every fine-tuned model is its own GPU deployment, um, you know, by the time you hit 16 fine-tuned models, you're already talking about well over $10,000 a month just to serve a system like this. So it becomes very expensive very quickly. And you know, we find that 16 fine-tuned models in production is not particularly crazy once you start talking about some of these more narrow applications like you know, an adapter per language for you know, code completion or things like that. Uh, it can be very easy to get to this point. So let's talk about how Lorax comes into play. And, and to do this, I want to briefly talk about fine-tuning uh, fine and parameter-efficient fine-tuning. So in conventional fine-tuning, your model has some weights. And then at every one of those weights, there's going to be um, a transformation that happens where the input passes through them, produces an output. We call the activations, and then goes to the next layer. And then during fine-tuning, there's a backpropagation process that then goes and updates the weights at every step during the training process. So for a 7 billion parameter model, you need to update all 7 billion of the weights. And as a result, your checkpoint and what ultimately gets ran out and then loaded at runtime for inference is a unique set of 7 billion parameters. And therefore, you have a footprint that's about you know, 14 gigabytes if you're using FP16 uh, to, to represent that. But uh, there are other techniques. I think a lot of people are probably familiar with LoRa or low rank adaptation, uh, which is a popular parameter efficient fine tuning technique. And the basic idea behind LoRa is that uh, you target specific weights of the model and instead of, um, uh, and essentially you introduce some additional parameters, uh, what we call a low rank decomposition um, alongside it that attempts to create a very similar, uh, or creates an, an output of the same shape that you can then uh, concatenate or rather add together with the original model outputs. Um, and the reason why you do this decomposition is just so that it creates a very small memory footprint. So usually on the order of like 
uh, tens of megabytes to hundreds of megabytes in the worst case. Um, and then during the backward pass, uh, instead of updating the, all the parameters of the model, you only update the uh, parameters that you introduce, these very small uh, lower weights. And then when we talk about how to go and serve this, um, then you know, it starts to look like a traditional kind of um, serving deployment in most cases. You have, you know, say, a Kubernetes pod. You have some weights uh, that are being represented here from the base model in orange. You have the weights from the fine-tuned adapter here in blue that you load alongside them. You have a request queue, and then you have a user who's sending requests. And then in the naive implementation, every single time <coughs> you want to serve another one of these fine-tuned models, you spin up another deployment and another and another, et cetera. But if you notice, um, the vast majority of the parameters in each of these deployments are exactly the same. And so you might naturally ask the question, like, couldn't we just you know, serve the base model parameters once and then serve these fine-tuned LoRa parameters together on a single deployment. And that's exactly what we do uh, with uh, Lorax, which I'll get into the details about how we do it in a moment, but essentially you go from this world where you have a single LoRa deployment here to a world where you have uh, multiple different LoRas all running together on the same deployment, and then dynamically being swapped in and out at runtime, um, and also being uh, used together in a single call at inference in a technique we call uh, heterogeneous continuous batching, uh, which I'll describe in a bit uh, further down. To use Lorax, it's very simple. Uh, we have a client. Uh, you can also use the REST API, and you can also use the OpenAI API as well. So we have an OpenAI compatible backend. Um, you just basically point the client to your instance. This, here we're assuming it's running on your local machine on port 8080. Uh, you can send it a prompt um, where you can fill in all the boilerplate as you like. Um, tell it how many tokens you want to generate and then you can print out the result. We also support streaming as well if you want to stream token by token for you know, more interactive uh, use cases. Um, and then to use an adapter, one of these fine-tuned LoRa's, um, all you have to do is in your request specify the ID, ID of that adapter, which can be uh, an ID in, a, in Hugging Face Hub, it can be an S3 file, it can be a file on your local machine, et cetera. Um, and then Predibase, or Lorax will do the work of loading that dynamically at runtime, uh, which usually incurs at most like a 100 millisecond penalty the first time you do it, uh, but it happens in the background, so if you have concurrent requests going on, it doesn't slow things down. Um, and then every subsequent call will be super quick because we cache it in memory um, and we don't have to do this loading process again. Most of the time is from you know, downloading over the network, uh, reading it in from disk, right? So now let's talk a little bit about uh, what's going on under the hood that makes this actually work. And so there are three things I want to touch on uh, that make Lorax kind of interesting. One is dynamic adapter loading, um, which is the basic principle of how we load in those uh, weights. The other is um, the adapter exchange scheduler. And then the third is uh, heterogeneous continuous batching. So dynamic adapter loading is exactly the process that I showed you that you know, we motivated this on the use case. Um, essentially, it allows you to say, as requests are coming in, uh, we feed them through the model together, but then when a new request comes in, we go ahead and in a separate background thread, we'll load the weights for that model um, and then load it onto uh, GPU um, as, as required. And so in order to make this not blow up our VRAM on the GPU, uh, what we do is we maintain the scheduler uh, that manages different tiers of memory um, during the runtime of the application. And so um, the first tier, or the highest tier, is what we call the active tier. That's the adapters that are resident on GPU at any given time. And so anything that's an active tier can be batched together into a single request, um, so a single forward pass of the model, um, and will be super fast to um, inference over because there's no transfer of weights between CPU and GPU memory that needs to occur. Um, the second tier down is what we call the pending tier. This lives on host memory. And effectively in this tier, these adapters are kind of waiting their turn, you could say. So at any given time, there might be some requests that are sitting in the queue that aren't able to be serviced because those adapters, um, because all the you know, space on the GPU is essentially full. And so what the scheduler will do is it'll try to balance between um, high throughput and low latency of the system by 
saying, OK, let's let some adapters sit on the GPU for a certain amount of time, complete some requests so that will help optimize throughput. But then we'll eventually swap out some of the adapters that have been on there for too long and let some of the adapters that have been waiting the longest go on to the active tier so they can complete so that we can minimize the kind of um, the, the latency to get the first token for uh, those requests. And then, of course, if you fill up the host memory even more, then we can always evict things out of host memory and, and go back to disk. Uh, but probably the most interesting optimization is the heterogeneous continuous batching. And so one question that we get asked a lot is, you know, is it the case that every single forward pass to the model is only one adapter at a time? And the answer is actually no. Um, we can, in fact, handle a single batch that has multiple different adapters at once. Um, and you can think about how to do this very naively uh, using something like a loop where, you know, if your batch here, every color is a different adapter, then what you would essentially do is, you know, first compute the activations from the base model weights, and then you go one row at a time and then grab the LoRa for that particular um, adapter and then compute uh, the uh, computation of multiplying the input times the A times the B um, for every single row of the, of the batch. The problem is that this is very slow. Um, so what we can do instead is we can think about trying to take advantage of the GPU's inherent parallelism um, through something like uh, imagining like a batching process where we take um, all the LoRa's that need to be applied to every row of the batch gathering them together at once, and then just computing uh, a single matrix multiplication of the input batch with um, the batch for the LoRa A tensors times the batch for the LoRa B tensors. Um, this is actually a three-dimensional multiplication in practice, but uh, you know, I think it's maybe easier to visualize there in 2D. Uh, but you can actually take this a step further as well. And uh, you know, one problem, I guess I should say, with this implementation is that while it is significantly faster than the looped implementation, it still has this problem of needing to create these physical tensors for every single row um, at every forward pass, which is expensive. Um, so what you can do instead is you can write a custom CUDA kernel that uh, does this through the use of uh, pointers instead. So rather than having to actually go and gather the weights together into this big block of memory, uh, you just compute the process in parallel using different uh, threads, right, on the GPU. And then every um, subprocess or subroutine is going to essentially be operating on, you know, different tiles of these uh, tensors. And you'll be able to just refer using, you know, pointer and direction lookup the specific uh, LoRa that you want to multiply against um, for every one of the rows or segments, rather, of the original input. And so this was work that wasn't done by us, this was work that was done by uh, some folks actually at University of Washington um, in a paper and a project that was called Punica that was published. Uh, but we've since integrated uh, their work into, into Lorax and also expanded on it a bit to support a few uh, of our use cases, like being able to have batches that contain both LoRa's as well as batches that contain just requests for the base model and, and various things like that. So then how does this actually translate into performance? Um, so if we look at throughput, uh, we can compare this optimized CUDA kernel versus that naive loop implementation that I showed you at the beginning. And you can see that with the looped implementation, as you increase the number of adapters that you're trying to process at a time, uh, the throughput degrades pretty significantly. But with these, this SGMV kernel, you can see that it's, uh, it's quite flat. Uh, there's very little degradation in throughput even as you scale up to 128 adapters in a single batch at a time, which is uh, quite a lot. We, we've never seen anyone in production actually doing that yet, uh, but it does show you that this has the potential to scale quite well. Similar story for latency. Uh, we look at the loop implementation, we see that latency increases essentially linearly, uh, whereas the latency uh, of the kernel is relatively constant. But I think probably the most important um, visualization for all of this is what this ultimately translates to in terms of cost. So if you compare this against something like GPT 3.5 Turbo with fine tuning, um, this might be a little bit out of date since they changed their pricing quite a lot. Uh, but per million tokens, last I, I checked, was around $6 per million tokens. Um, 
for inference, whereas with a dedicated deployment, obviously it's quite a bit lower initially. This is assuming you're running on an A10G and AWS again. But once you get to 32 models, um, you very quickly surpass the cost of something like OpenAI, uh, assuming like, you know, something like full utilization at all times. Uh, but with Lorax and the ability to run all these on a single GPU, what it means is that you know, even when you go up to 32 uh, adapters uh, that are running at once, the cost is still very low. It's effectively the same as it was with just a single model. And that means that your you know, overall cost of ownership is significantly lower than either the commercial offerings or uh, doing the kind of you know, one model at a time route. Uh, so that's the basic premise. Now, we also do a lot more in Lorax to optimize things beyond um, that. Um, so I'll quickly talk about a few that um, I think are noteworthy. Uh, the first is support for multi-GPU and tensor parallelism. Uh, so certainly for some of these larger models, we find that um, you, know, you can't run them on a single GPU. Um, but that does provide some complications when you talk about how to handle multiple different adapters. Uh, there was a paper called S-Lora that was published last year that introduced a, um, a pretty interesting tensor parallelism strategy that we integrate into Lorax. Uh, so this is a visualization from their paper. Uh, but I believe we were the first to actually implement it um, in production code. Um, they, they actually, in their repo, did not implement it uh, at the time. But the paper was quite nice at explaining it, so luckily it was pretty easy to integrate. Um, similarly, CUDA graph compilation. Uh, this is another technique that's becoming very popular for particularly these smaller models for being able to avoid having to uh, repeatedly go back to the host to dispatch requests to the GPU. You can instead trace the graph once and figure out what all the uh, instructions you want to send are and then repeat that over and over and over again very efficiently. And we found that for smaller models like uh, Phi 2 and in particular very small models like GPT-2 uh, medium, um, that there are significant uh, throughput improvements of you know, over 2x uh, by using compilation. And that's a flag you can enable very easily um, with just a dash dash compile in Lorax. Um, OpenAI client support as well, as I mentioned. So a lot of folks you know, use this instead of using um, you know, whatever op other options there has become a bit of a standard. So you can just point it at your Lorax instance, um, and then you can use any adapter in the model uh, parameter here and then use your normal uh, kind of chat API, and then assuming that the model that you're you know, working with has um, a chat template that it can use to know, you know what the system role is, what the user role is, et cetera. Um, usually that's part of the tokenizer configuration hugging face. Uh, then it will be able to uh, process that as well. And uh, structure generation is one of the more recent ones that uh, has been getting a lot of traction lately, so this is where you know, you might have some very specific requirements for what the model should output. Like, I want you to create a character for my new RPG, and I want it to have, you know, a certain armor type, a certain class and age, and et cetera. Um, and then you can basically use the schema to enforce that whatever comes out of the model fits that exact schema. Um, and one thing that's nice about um, fine tuning as it relates to this use case, we did some, um, analysis uh, comparing the results of using this sort of structured output generation without fine tuning and found that uh, while, you know, compared to the base model, just applying the structured output constraints uh, did in fact make the model perform much better than, you know, without, obviously. Um, after fine tuning, we actually got the performance to be even better than using these structured um, output generation techniques like outlines alone. But then when combining them both together, so you're fine tuning and you're also telling it, you know, you must adhere to this schema, we found that actually improved performance even more. So uh, this is definitely, I think, a case where there's a better together story where you want to use structured output generation and you also want to um, do fine tuning for your specific tasks to get it to perform the best uh, in production. And uh, one more uh, that we've recently added is speculative decoding. Uh, this is one I'm a particularly big fan of because it's uh, one that, you know, it's a very lightweight fine-tuning technique that lets you uh, dramatically improve the performance of your model. Essentially what you do is you, uh, instead of just having your, uh, a layer of the model that predicts one token, you have these additional layers that you fine-tune that whose goal is to predict the, you know, N plus one token or the N plus two token. Um, and so you do this, you fine tune it for your specific task, and then you find that you can get two to three X speed up in terms of throughput. Uh, 
this way. Uh, the nice thing about recent uh, iterations of uh, this Medusa technique, particularly um, that Hugging Face has been uh, making, is that uh, they're actually now quite parameter efficient. So a particular uh, Medusa um, adapter is usually only around um, 80 to 90 megabytes right now for a 7 billion parameter model. So you can very easily uh, use them the same way you would use LoRa and be able to fuse them together such that um, for any particular task, any particular fine-tuned adapter you might have, you could also have a speculative decoding head that goes with it that not only makes the performance better, but makes the speed better as well. Um, and then last but not least, uh, one other technique I'm particularly interested in is this idea of uh, mixture of adapters-based uh, techniques where you might have a bunch of different task-specific uh, um, adapters, say maybe one that does uh, is really good at math or one that's really good at uh, logical reasoning. And then for applications like chat where you don't know a priori uh, what, uh, what type of adapter the user needs to answer their question, you can use these routing architectures uh, to be able to figure out, um, okay, for this particular query, what is the fine-tuned adapter that I need to be using in order to answer the question? And then one way that you could do that very naively is you have some kind of lookup strategy, like maybe embedding-based, you know, semantic search-based, to then find the right adapter. Or some of these uh, really interesting techniques, like there's one called Fat Goose that recently came out, um, allows you to, at the per-layer level, determine, okay, you know, similar to a mixture of experts technique like Mixtral uses, uh, you can, per layer, say, I'm going to route um, you know, this particular activation to this particular LoRa, and then at the next layer, I might route uh, differently to a different LoRa, right? And be able to do that all dynamically, layer by layer in the model. So I think this is, in particular, going to be uh, a very interesting future direction that could allow these small 7 billion parameter models through sparsity to essentially be able to achieve uh, much, much better performance, you know, comparable to these 100 billion parameter models just by having access to hundreds of these different adapters that are all highly specialized to these tasks. Um, and then, you know, of course, like if you want to build production systems on top of this, um, just a brief comment on how we did it at Predabase. Um, you can imagine having, you know, uh, a multi-tiered system that you can build on top of Kubernetes. Uh, in our case, we have, you know, an API gateway. We have some services that live in our control plane, uh, metadata DB. Um, and then for building these adapters, you know, we run fine-tuning jobs on top of Kubernetes. And then for our deployment, you know, we also run uh, individual replicas as pods inside a deployment. So you might have multiple different Lorax instances uh, running as different replicas here that then reference some object storage like S3 to be able to load the adapters at runtime. But one problem that I think is quite interesting is how to effectively load balance across these different adapters. And uh, this is one that um, we've been doing some active investigation into recently that we call you know, consistent adapter hashing. Uh, basically, the concept here is that if you have multiple Lorax replicas, Ideally, rather than doing something like a round robin load balancer, we just kind of send them all essentially arbitrarily to different um, replicas. What you can do is uh, try to pack in requests for the same adapter to the same replica, which helps improve the batching. Um, and you can do that at the load balancer level, uh, which is something that uh, we've been looking into as well. So definitely wanted to call that out. And uh, yeah, that's it. So I believe that ends right about on time. Um, you know, I think wrapping up, don't do the thing on the left, do the thing on the right. Uh, and definitely check out Lorax, uh, this image brought to you by, by Dolly. Uh, and uh, yeah, check it out and let me know if you have any questions. Oh, yes. Good question, yeah. So uh, for some models, we can do CPU inference, um, some of the older models like Bloom in particular. However, for the more recent models, um, we've natively integrated things like flash attention and page detention into the main uh, loop of the model. So um, they do not run on CPU because uh, you know, we made the decision to very specifically try to optimize for uh, 
the GPU use case. And, and also in particular, I should note that we currently require um, Ampere or above NVIDIA GPUs just because that's the minimum that Flash Attention 2 supports at the moment. Um, but it's definitely something that we've been looking into is support for other architectures like AMD. Um, we also have some folks at Qualcomm um, that we've been talking with. So it's definitely something we're hoping to revisit is kind of broad and beyond NVIDIA. Yes. Yeah, so I think stable diffusion is one that is already, I think, finding quite a lot of success with fine tuning and, and LoRa's in particular, where you can do LoRa's for style transfer and style adaptation. I actually think LMs are still kind of waiting to have their moment where they, you know, have similar success as stable diffusion has for that, where you can, you know, really think about like a community forming around different LoRa's for different text generation use cases. Um, but I definitely think probably the biggest untapped potential right now is on the multimodal, like visual language models in particular. I think that um, as those become more popular, we're going to see a lot more uh, usage of LoRa to improve the quality of the responses for reasoning about images. Um, and we don't yet support visual language models in LoRa, but it is, uh, is something that we're planning on adding in an upcoming release. Um, so it's definitely something that's on our radar. All right, well, if there are no more questions, thanks everyone for coming out today, and uh, yeah, I really appreciate it, and definitely reach out on GitHub. <laughs>